I would like to welcome you to the Topshi Memorial webinar series. St. Evax University and the Nova Scotia Federation of Labour acknowledge that we are gathered this evening in, in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Before we proceed, please know that tonight's webinar will be recorded and shared on the organizer's social media channels. The Topshi webinar series is sponsored by the Topshi Memorial Fund, which was established in 1984 to honor the memory of Reverend George Topshi. Topshi was the director of the St. Evax Extension Department from 1969 to 1982. He worked to maintain close links to organized labor, cooperators, and credit unions. Topshi saw workers in their trade unions and consumers and producers in their cooperatives and credit unions as part of the same cause for social justice and economic democracy. The death of Father Topshi prompted leaders in the labor movement in Atlantic Canada to establish the Topshi Memorial Fund. From 1984 until 2004, the St. Evex Extension Department hosted 18 Topshi Memorial Conferences, attracting an average of almost 300 people per conference. I will now call upon Danny Cavanaugh, President of the Nova Scotia Federation of Labour, to bring greetings on behalf of the Federation and to lead us in remembering those who lost their lives or suffered injury or illness on the job or due to a work-related tragedy with a moment of silence on this, the eve of the National Day of Mourning. Danny? Well, thanks, Pauline, and welcome, everybody, and thanks for your uh, participation this evening. This evening, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the Day of Mourning and, and what it means and uh, a little bit around the uh, Westray Bill, which has been in force since 2004, and how that's been working, and uh, a few other topics around, you know, workers' occupational health and safety. So the Federation represents about 70,000 workers in Nova Scotia. We've been working with the, with the folks at Cody and St. Evax for a year now, actually. This is the anniversary of the very first a webinar we did on the exact same date a year ago around safety issues as well. So we're very pleased to be working with Cody and and all of our other union partners, um, you know, around safety issues uh, that workers have in the province. And um, and we're really pleased to have uh, the guests that we have with us tonight. So I'd ask everybody if we can take uh, just a moment of silence uh, before we get started to remember all those workers that were injured and killed in a workplace accident. Thanks everyone. Polly? Thank you, Danny. Before I introduce tonight's speakers, I will say a few words about process. Each of our four speakers will have seven minutes to present. I will ask you, the audience, to type your questions in chat, and as many of them as possible will be addressed in the question and answer period after we have heard from all four speakers. If you have any technical issues, please go back to the link for the webinar and rejoin the call. If you are experiencing other issues while on the call, please type them in chat addressed to Brian Lazuri, who is providing technical assistance for us this evening. And if possible, Brian will assist you. At this time, I'm very pleased to welcome our speakers. The first you have already heard from, Danny Cavanaugh, President of the Nova Scotia Federation of Labour, Carla Thibodeau, Staff Representative of the United Steelworkers, Lawrence McKay, Atlantic Area Coordinator, United Steelworkers, and Bill Hind, Sector Council Advisor with the Newfoundland and Labrador Federation of Labour. I will now welcome Danny Cavanaugh back to the mic. Danny was first elected President of the Nova Scotia Federation of Labour in October 2015. 
He was reelected for a second term in 2017, a third term in 2019, and a fourth term in 2021. He represents 80,000 members in over 400 union locals. Before this, he served as vice president at large for over 10 years. Danny has been instrumental in ensuring the efforts of the Federation make Nova Scotia a better place to live and work. Welcome, Danny. Well, thanks, Pauline. And uh, again, welcome to everybody. And my background tells a different story. I'm not really in Vegas. I'm in uh, just outside, uh, just outside Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the best I could do at this point with my background. But uh, anyway, this is what it is, and we'll live through it. So uh, every year, thousands of people gather on April 28th to observe the National Day of Mourning. The purpose of the Day of Mourning is twofold. It's to remember and honor those lives lost or injured because of their work, and to renew our commitment to prevent further deaths, injuries, and diseases by improving health and safety in the workplace. April 28th is observed in many different ways around the world. Many labor organizations, unions, families, communities, and government agencies coordinate public events that include speeches, moments of silence, laying wreaths and flowers, lighting candles, planting trees, unveiling monuments, laying out empty shoes or hard hats to symbolize those who have died at work. Some events involve active campaigning on relevant issues, public demonstrations, or workplace or public awareness sessions that provide information regarding occupational health and safety. Lots of times individuals don ribbons or black armbands, bracelets, or stickers to show their support, and workers on the, workers on the water in trains or in transport trucks will often blow the whistle or horn at 11 a.m. on April the 28th in honor of the day. The canary in the cage is an internationally recognized symbol for workers' health and safety. And in the 19th century, coal mines did not have ventilation systems, as we well know here in Nova Scotia. Uh, and so coal miners used canaries to warn them of the hazards about air quality. Canaries are more sensitive to airborne hazards such as methane and carbon dioxide than humans. And as long as the canary kept singing, the miners knew their air supply was safe. A dead canary signaled an immediate evacuation from the mine. As it goes without saying, this was a very inadequate form of health and safety protection for miners. And many miners died in those poor conditions. Many labor organizations have adopted some of the canary in the cage to symbolize a day of mourning. According to the Association of the Workers' Compensation Boards of Canada, nationally every year, approximately a thousand workers die. Every day, nearly three workers die, and every year workers suffer from 250,000 work-related injury or disease. Every day, workers suffer from 685 work-related injuries or disease. The history of the Day of Mourning has a very proud Canadian labor history. At the Canadian Labor Congress Convention in 1984, a resolution was submitted by the Canadian Union of Public Employees National Health and Safety Committee recommending the creation of a Remembrance Day for workers killed or injured on the job. The resolution was readily adopted by convention delegates, and the date April the 28th was chosen as on April the 28th in 1914, the first Comprehensive Workers' Compensation Act was passed in the legislature, and the CLC officially declared and recognized the National Day of Mourning in April the 28th, 1985. The act is a brief piece of legislation which reads in part throughout Canada in each year, every year, the 28th of the day of April shall be known under the name of day of mourning for persons killed or injured in the workplace. This movement quickly spread outside Canada and the United States in 1989. The American Federation of Labor began to recognize April the 28th as Workers Memorial Day. The United Kingdom and the UK began their campaign to recognize this day in 1992, and Workers' Memorial Day was adopted in the Scottish Trade Union Congress in 1993. The International Labor Organization, the ILO, and the International uh, uh, 
Tuck declared the International Day of Mourning in 1996, and let's and let's ca us carry on the international cry to mourn for the dead and fight for the living. Tomorrow, we will gather at Province House to remember with a moment of silence beginning at 11 a.m. We'll also honor the many families and friends who have deeply affected by these tragedies, and every worker has the right to return home safe and sound at the end of each workday. By working together with employers, workers, and our health and safety partners, we can prevent work injuries and death before they occur. In 2021, 20 workers lost their lives due to a workplace accident or illness. Tomorrow's event at the legislature here in Nova Scotia, I will MC the event. It'll be held outside, rain or shine. As I said, we'll have a moment of silence. We have speakers, the Honorable Minister of Labor and Skills and Immigration, Bill Bo Jill Balser will speak, the President of the Halifax and Dartmouth District Labor Council, Debbie Richardson, the Liberal MLA for Halifax Armdale, Ali Dula, the Workers' Compensation Board of Nova Scotia, Chief, Chief Executive Officer Stuart McLean will speak, Janesta Holleran Peters, a Westray family member, will also be speaking, as will the leader of the New Democratic Party, uh, the NDP, Gary Burrow. And we have a special guest joining us this year uh, in Halifax at the legislature from the Canadian Labor Congress, it's President B. Brusque. Then on May 9th, we are also planning a big event on the 30th anniversary of the West Raymond explosion. There will be a memorial service at the West Ray Memorial Park over in New Glasgow starting at 7 p.m. There'll be a march around 6 p.m. to the West Ray Park from the Curling Club We'll also do a session with school kids in high school in, in the uh, morning and an afternoon roundtable discussion on safety and the Westray Bill. In 2004, many unions and the Canadian Labour Congress lobbied the government for the Westray legislation, a law that would see criminal investigations in a workplace death or serious accidents. Yeah, you know that only the police or the Crown can lay criminal charges in, when a worker dies on the job and they are much different from what the provincial safety inspectors can do, who only follow the provincial act. In Nova Scotia, we're lucky to have a special prosecutor for safety, and we're one of the few provinces with one. Sadly, in our province, just one charge so far under the Westray legislation was laid. Fewer than 20 charges have been laid across the country since 2004, and to me, that speaks volumes that the law is not working as intended. If I can close with this, if the police are called when they find a dead body, they immediately start an investigation. The question I ask is, why wouldn't they do the same when they get called to a worker's death in a workplace? I know our friends from the steel workers will be take, talking more on this, as will folks from Newfoundland and Labrador as they, and the work that they have done around the Westray Bill. Sorry if I ran a bit over time, but it's all very a very important discussion, and we need to change the culture on safety in the workplace, especially for the courts who often hand out fines to corporations that amount to a slap on the wrist. We say we can do better, and we need to do better. 458 workers in Nova Scotia have died at or because of work since the Westray legislation came into force in 2004. So Pauline, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Danny. And, and thanks so much for bringing it, calling it back to mind for us, how very important this, this National Day of Mourning truly is. And, and it's truly an, a, a global day of mourning. Uh, you've reminded us of the importance to take, it, take the opportunity to raise awareness about the issues uh, facing workers in their workplaces, uh, to use the opportunity for one of education and of course, to always remember those whom we've lost. Before I introduce our next speaker, I would like to invite people, recognizing that tonight we have an Atlantic Canadian audience. If anyone would like to enter in chat uh, the traditional territories from which they're joining us this evening, please feel free to do so. It would be wonderful to see those territories acknowledged. And I would also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge uh, Mary Shortle, President of the Newfoundland and Labrador Federation of Labor, whom I see has joined the call. 
Uh, Mary was invited to be with us as a panelist this evening. Uh, she is traveling and I believe she is going to be uh, speaking later this evening at another event and, and participating in National Day of Mourning events, I believe in Labrador uh, tomorrow. So Mary, we're really appreciative to see you on the call. And perhaps when uh, we get to the point of Bill sharing some of the work that's happened in Newfoundland, uh, if you're still with us, we would certainly welcome you to, uh, to join in at that point. However, right now, I would like to introduce Carla Thibodeau. Carla has been a proud steel worker for 24 years. She joined the United Steel Workers when she was hired by a credit union and quickly learned the value of belonging to a union. Carla was a local president for 16 years and was a facilitator for the United Steel Workers before assuming her current position as staff representative for New Brunswick. A strong advocate for health and safety, Carla has been an emergency response training coordinator since the program was implemented in Canada in 2005. Welcome, Carla. Thank you. And welcome to everybody. And thanks for being on uh, joining, us, joining us this evening. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, I'd like to speak to you about a program that I'm involved with and, and have been. Uh, since roughly about 2005. Um, it's a program that's really near and dear to my heart um, and something I'm proud that the United Steelworkers offers. Um, and that program is called the Emergency Response Team. And what that, what that team does or, or what it entails is basically uh, what the steelworkers have are coordinators in every district across Canada and the US. Uh, and we act as a liaison between uh, the victim of a fatality or a critical illness, um, the family and, and the employer. Um, so what happens is basically when there is a fatality or a critical uh, injury, um, you can call a 1-800 number and a coordinator uh, will be sent out uh, immediately. And what that coordinator does, um, and, and let me be clear, it's not to investigate an accident or, uh, or a job site. Uh, it's strictly to, to work with a family uh, and, and the victim um, if, if that is the case. So what happens is um, we get the call, um, we work with a local union um, in that area, we establish um, different 1-800 numbers or people that they can contact for help um, have different programs, and uh, it may be uh, it may be what resources are available in that area. So we actually drive in or fly in, and it could be in it, it could be in your local area, it could be in your own country, or it could actually even be in in a different country. And what it what it entails is it can be anything from, for example, uh, of just working um, with the with a family of say um, someone who who has just lost. Their, their partner or their spouse or, or father or mother or sister, um, working with them and what we can do to, to ease that burden or to help them through that period of time. As, as union leaders, um, so often we're involved in the everyday life of working people and filing grievances and resolving issues and at the bargaining table and, and helping people um, in the here and now, but what we never want to forget about is is helping people in their lowest of times and being there uh, in their toughest of times. So we may go in and and talk with the family and see what they need or um, and I can give you different examples of whether it might be getting a call um, for a family who who is um, for a specific example whose whose husband, father, brother uh, have been involved in a in a critical injury and is in a burn unit in another, in another city. Uh, as we know, being in small towns, if it's a critical injury, um, you're often uh, airlifted to another facility somewhere. So it may be talking with the employer and trying to um, get costs covered for hotels, for meals. Um, I, can, I can recall another instance where um, the wife of a gentleman who was killed on the job um, was worried about people coming into town for the funeral. And, and we asked her what she, what she needed. And she was really worried about, she had this 
beautiful home and meticulous uh, landscape lot. And her concern was, you know, to get the grass cut before people came into town. And it's those basic needs. But it's about it's about being with people and, and connecting and seeing what we can do, like I said, in their darkest hours. We um, were so lucky to have the West Ray bill in Canada. Uh, the US looks quite different. And some of these court cases go on for years and years and years. Um, typically in the US, once you have a critical illness, sorry, a critical injury or a fatality, um, you're instantly classified as fired. You're cut off from, and your family's cut off from all of their, their coverage and their benefits. We had a gentleman who um, was a victim of a critical illness and he was uh, involved in an explosion. And he suffered horrific, horrific injuries. He had lost both of his hands. Uh, he had lost one eye. He had severe burns to, I think it was 78% of his body. And he was not expected to live. Um, the doctors had given him 24 hours. So the company was, was wonderful for 24 hours. And on hour 25, um, they cut him, they, they terminated him. So they cut off his benefits. Um, his wife had, had gone to the drugstore two days later and that's how she found out because they had no coverage uh, for the son. Uh, but that court case went on for eight years. Um, and what happened finally when, when a uh, inspector finally retired, eight years later, um, he, he had an awakening where he decided he was gonna, finally gonna tell the truth. And he admitted that he had actually rubber stamped a piece of equipment saying that it was safe. Um, the company had paid him $100,000 to do it. And uh, eight years later, finally, this gentleman got justice. And, and he now is a motivational speaker and, and, and travels across both Canada and the United States to tell his story. Um, but, but I can remember um, and hearing stories and, and I've met the gentleman and, and talking about it and talk about basic needs of people and what people want and, and, and the hardships that they go through when something happens on the job and they can't get any help and they're cut off from, from benefits. This particular gentleman was burned so bad his mouth wouldn't close. So he went through chapstick, like probably a chapstick a day. His basic need was that he needed, he had been cut off from his company, he had been cut off from his job. He had lost, his wife had left, his family had left, and he was in a court battle for eight years, no income. Like, and that, and that was his need, right, of, of, of having to provide or wanting someone to provide a basic need of, of chapstick. So we really need to connect with our members our you know community members and 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 coworkers and 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 help people in their times of needs because unfortunately as Danny had said there's still over a thousand people nationally killed every year on the job and that's a thousand too many and we and we need to work together if you know how we can get through this and that's why bills like West Ray and that's why lobbying government and trying to pass legislation is so important people are being hurt every single day. People are being killed every day and it has to stop. Um, I can leave you with a story of people asking why you do what you do. And I will share you a story. And it's about a, a forest fire in Africa. And the flames are spreading through the, the forest. And all the animals are running for their lives. They're running to stay ahead of the flames. And as they run, the flames close in behind them and they run further. And the animals ran all day and they ran all night. And finally they stopped to rest beside a lake. And all the animals slept except for one, except for the hummingbird. He flew to the lake, picked up a little beak of water, flew back to the fire and poured it on the flames. Flew to the lake, picked up a little beak of water, flew back to the fire and poured it on the flames. And he did this tirelessly throughout the night. 
and the animals stirred. They wondered what he was doing. And finally, one animal was, was angry. He said, why are you doing this? You're too small, you're too insignificant. You'll never make a difference. But the hummingbird said, I'm doing all that I can. I am doing all that I can. Brothers and sisters, as union activists, as educators, as employees, as employers, health and safety is everyone's concern. And we need to all do it together. Each and every one of us must do all that we can. Thank you. Oh my goodness, Carla, you've just made this topic very real for every single person on the webinar this evening, I am sure. Thank you so much for sharing your experience with us as difficult and challenging as I'm sure it must be at times. And thank you for the work that you do to support people who are in such dire need of the supports you provide. Um, and I'm sure that while we all may feel like the hummingbird at times, it's so important to remember that if we, if we all assume the role of the hummingbird, we can accomplish so very much more together than we can working alone. Thank you. I will now invite Lawrence McKay to the mic. Lawrence began working at Heath Steel Mines in his hometown of Miramichi, New Brunswick in 1988. He became actively involved with his union, the United Steel Workers, Local 5319, serving as a shop steward in 1990, vice president in 1995, and president of the local from 1996 until the mine closed in 1999. The United Steel Workers then hired Lawrence as a casual organizer, and within a month, he became the staff representative serving Nova Scotia. He was promoted to Atlantic Area Coordinator in 2009, a position he still holds today. Coming from the mining sector, Lawrence quickly became aware of the importance of safe and healthy workplaces for all workers. Welcome, Lawrence. Thank you, Pauline, and uh, thanks for the invitation. And uh, I'm, I'm going to start off with the, uh, I guess, basically the history of, of our organizing campaign, our, our campaign to, to get the West Ferry law changed. Uh, hopefully, I, uh, I won't go over your, the seven minutes. I'll try really hard. Uh, it's pretty hard to follow Carla, uh, but I'm, I'm getting used to that now. Uh, but in 1992, uh, prior to the, to the West Ray Mine explosion, the United Steelworkers had an organizing campaign at the uh, West Ray Mine with uh, Kura Resources. Uh, our organizer had signed uh, probably close to 50% of the cards when the mine blew up, when, when the tragedy occurred. Uh, and of course, uh, when, the, when, when things kind of settled down, the, the organization made a, made a, a decision that uh, we would not stop the organizing campaign. Uh, that organizer worked tirelessly uh, with the, the, um, the miners that worked there, with the ones that, that were uh, on service, uh, signed the cards and organized that mine. Uh, knowing that there would never be another mining operation there, but also knowing that it was the right thing to do, that these workers and these victims needed representation and they needed it more than ever. Um, and before I go further, the reason that this organizing drive started when it did prior to the explosion is that those workers were really worried about safety in that mine. This wasn't an issue where we we went in to organize and it's they weren't making money, they weren't making big money and they, you know, with job security. That wasn't an issue. The issue was their health and safety, and they were concerned about their health and safety. And obviously they were right. Uh, so 
after the mine, uh, after the disaster and the mine exploded, uh, United Steelworkers sent people in to work with the families, to help the families through the process, through the legal process, all through the uh, inquiry, um, still representing the, the, the miners and the members that were there tirelessly. Uh, we had people that worked there day and night and stayed there until the inquiry was done. And I, I think everybody knows what the inquiry said, that it was putting it bluntly, basically murder. It was a, a disaster that should have been seen, should have been understood prior to it happening. Some of the things that the, the health and safety inspectors did, some of the things that they overlooked, very clear in the inquiry report. It was, the decision was made by the organization and, and the people involved to, you know, we can't let this happen again. We, we need to do everything that we can do. The same as the hummingbird. We need to do what we can to make sure that this never happens again. So the Westray campaign was started uh, with the help of, of the NDP and, and drawing a bill up that we wanted in place. That lobbying effort, and, and with lobbying, it's never easy. Uh, especially when you have two political parties that don't even want to talk to us, to try to get the political will to make changes to the law to hold companies accountable. So we started with lobbying efforts, lobbying campaigns. We, we took members from across the country. We would take them to Ottawa for a day, two days, three days, a week at a time. We would meet with all the politicians and try to get them to uh, agree to vote yes on this bill to change the legislation so the West Ferry Law would, would have some teeth. Um, that took over 10 years before the politicians actually said, okay, we're gonna change the law. And the law was changed. And that's a, that's a huge victory. We were celebrating. This was, this was a victory that, you know, finally, we're gonna get some justice. Finally, we're gonna do something and, we're, and we've changed the law to make it better for people to go to work so that people can go to work and come home in the same shape as they went. And if something happens, that somebody will be held accountable. The people that were responsible for the Western mine disaster, if it happens again, maybe they'll be held accountable. Well, again, that law was on the books for another 10 years and absolutely nothing happened. There was never, there was no charges. The investigations that Danny talked about earlier, where the police are called and they investigate a scene where they find a dead body, that wasn't happening, even with the new Westray law. So, and I do see that Sylvia Boyce, our uh, health and safety coordinator for the district is on, is on as one of the uh, participants. Uh, and I believe it was her and uh, a few of our other staff who said, okay, the, enough's enough, let's, let's, see if we can get the courts and the police and the inspectors to start using this law. So we started a, a campaign called Stop the Killing, Enforce the Law. And in this campaign, we, we, we recruited our members from across the country again. <laughs> it started with awareness of social media posts, we also uh, got people and trained people to go to town councils, to municipalities, to their meetings with a resolution that says, we want this law followed. We want this, this people held accountable. And many, many towns and cities and municipalities across the country adopted that resolution. Nova Scotia was, was we were really successful in mostly most of the municipalities and towns adopted it, no questions asked, because they lived through it. They lived through West, West Ray and they knew it was things that, that happened. But I will say, and I'll call them out here tonight, that there was one town that I presented the resolution to, and it was the town of Truro, who flatly refused to even look at the resolution. We don't need to do that. We don't need to get involved. That's the only one that I ever made a presentation to, the only town, municipality, or city that I made a presentation to that said no. Um, and, and we haven't stopped with that. 
all, even though many have, have, have signed on to this resolution as a town council or a city council or a municipality, many have signed on. There's still many that, that we haven't been able to get to. So I'll ask people that are listening to this tonight or watching this tonight that if you live in a town that hasn't passed this resolution, reach out to me or you reach out to the United States Workers National Office. Uh, you can find my contact information on, the, on USW.ca and we will work with you or we will go to that town council and try to get this, this resolution passed. That resolution with the, the many that did uh, support it, did bring some change. It brought some change with, uh, and as well as our campaign, getting the police associations and the, uh, the justice departments uh, involved in, in getting some training for police officers to start to use this, this law. Um, and even though uh, I think there's been 18 charges laid across Canada in the last uh, several years, uh, only one of those charges uh, went to distance and, and one person was found guilty and is actually in jail today and it's a, a company out of Ontario. Um, but that's it, that's it. We have over, average over a thousand people a year who die in Canada because of workplace accidents. That's not even including illnesses. That's not even including someone being poisoned by, poisoned by the chemicals they're using or, or, or any of that. That's people that die every day, over a thousand a year. If you think about that, it's, it's pretty sad that this it's 2022 and this is still happening. So we're not done. Our campaign's not done. We wanna make sure that everybody, every accident is, is investigated as if it were a crime, the same as they would do with any other body that they found. And that's what needs to happen. So again, I wanna I want thank you for the invitation to, uh, to take part in this and uh, I look forward to the questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lawrence, and thank you for the, you know, the stark reminder that once once a bill is passed, uh, sadly, the work is not over, you know, that we have to continue uh, to educate and to raise awareness and to, to advocate uh, for changes and for, for, for these laws to be used in the way they were intended to be used. Uh, really important message that you've shared with us this evening. Thank you. Our final speaker this evening is Bill Hind, who joins us from St. John's, Newfoundland. For the past nine years, Bill has been the safety sector advisor for the Newfoundland and Labrador Federation of Labor, with a focus on improving occupational health and safety at the industry level. His, his work includes helping the Federation advocate for improvements in occupational health and safety and workers' compensation. Prior to this, Bill spent three decades employed with Oxfam Canada as the National Campaigns Coordinator. Much of this work focused on improving worker rights in global sweatshops, promoting fair trade coffee, and fighting for the right to basic public services, such as water and sanitation. Bill, the mic is yours. Thanks, Pauline, and uh, it really is, uh... I'm blown away by the panelists so I've already heard. So thanks very much. This is, uh, yeah, it's quite, it's quite uh, a privilege to be here. Um, I must start by recognizing that I am coming uh, to you from the island of Newfoundland, where, which is the ancestral homelands of the Beothic and Mi'kmaq. Um, and as you noted earlier, I'm actually here uh, replacing Mary Shortle, uh, the president of the Federation of Labor. And as you said, Mary's currently in Labrador City meeting with uh, 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 steelworker locals there and other unions in preparation for the day of mourning tomorrow where Mary will be a keynote speaker. And uh, so my job tonight is actually to tell the story of uh, our experience of uh, building a relationship with the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary around West Ray legislation. And uh, so uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of a timeline of how this evolved. 
So it all starts uh, actually in, in the summer of 2017, Mary, uh, as the president of the Federation of Labor in Newfoundland Labrador, uh, joined with the other presidents in uh, Edmonton. Uh, and I think Danny was there, uh, but this is an annual event where the, the, the heads of the, the federations come together at the same time as when the premiers meet and, and with the hope of uh, advocating for different things. Well, at this, uh, these meetings in Edmonton, one of the uh, um, presentations was from a, an occupational psychologist by the name of Rob Stewart. And Rob had a keen interest in Westray and, and the Westray Act in particular, but, and, and how there hadn't been much uptake. But what he was uh, able to uh, inform uh, the Fed leaders was that Calgary had been the first police force to actually uh, uh, do some training around Westray and to take it seriously, in large part because of a major occupational fatality that happened in downtown Calgary that really shocked sort of the, the community. And they realized this is something that, how come we, we just don't seem to, uh, we let OSH division deal with this stuff. Anyways, Mary came back uh, from those meetings uh, determined to meet with the local police here in St. John's. And um, so what happened was uh, later that fall, Mary and I went traipsing down and met with Chief Joe Boland and legal counsel Wendy Sadibiak. And uh, the meeting was cordial, and it was, but it was clear to us that the Westray Act was not something they were familiar with. Um, and it was uh, clear, like Chief Boland was quite blunt. Uh, he said, you know, the you know, the typical response of police officers to a serious injury or fatality at a work site was these things were best handled by. Uh, occupational health and safety officers. So, um, but they they clearly listened to us and and um, they did agree that uh, whatever there's a fatality, it is the role of the police to first treat it as a crime scene, potential crime scene. They should be there. So I think they felt a bit sort of, you know, they 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 didn't have an excuse. They just realized that is something that you know uh, had. had they, they devolve powers to uh, occupational health and safety officers. So um, we arranged a, a follow-up meeting and uh, we also uh, encouraged them and, and uh, to do some homework, which they said they would, and also to reach out to the Calgary police and learn from their experience. We, uh, uh, we followed up, uh, we'd actually organized uh, in 2018, uh, a conference around occupational health and safety, and we invited the chief to speak to it. We thought this is a way for him to learn about the importance of occupational health and safety and what we would expect our police forces to be doing whenever there's a workplace fatality or serious injury. Anyways, I think he clearly was impressed and uh, he did reach out and the end result was um, in a follow-up meeting, he told us that um, yes, they decided that the St. John's RNC would become the pol second police force to do training around the West Ray legislation. And they invited Rob Stewart and a Calgary police officer who happened to be a transplanted Newfoundlander to come and do two days of training. And I was able to sit in with the, uh, the police officials. So, uh, uh, and again, uh, it, it was to impress upon them. Uh, every workplace fatality should be treated as a crime scene. Now, it, the other part of this was Mary and I, uh, Mary also reached out to the acting commissioner, uh, uh, Parsons, uh, who was the acting head of the RCMP for Newfoundland and Labrador. Because again, the police forces here, like many other places, the RNC is responsible for St. John's, Northeast Avalon, uh, Lab City, uh, Corner Brook, but it's the R RCMP that's first on the scene in most smaller uh, uh, towns and communities. That's their beat. So we also had a meeting with them. And again, we were uh, informed that they too were uh, taking, uh, uh, they told us anyways, that they, uh, that Westray, they took Westray serious and, and that um, it, 
I guess for their authorities were telling them. So I think the push from the federal government and, and I'm sure a push from the United Steelworkers was this is a federal legislation, you have to act on it. Um, in 2019, uh, at our last constitutional convention prior to COVID, we again asked Chief Boland to address the delegates. We wanted an update. So we kept on feeling we need to stay re-engaged with the police. Uh, but what we, this time we had Chief Boland uh, follow Vernon Terrio. Now, Vernon was a Westray miner uh, who happened to be off shift the day of the explosion. And Vernon has since, uh, and I'm not sure if I can show it in the camera, has written a book uh, called Westray. And uh, it's a very powerful story. And, and Vernon uh, post Westray is, is dealing with PTSD. And um, uh, so, it clearly, once he spoke, again, if, if Chief Boland was not familiar with the West React when we first met him, he now was well versed in why this law needed policing. Um, so what has been the result? Well, uh, again, as I said, we, have, we had a very good relationship. We saw the training. So we were really hopeful that things, we would see some changes. And um, the good news I'd say is that we've noticed that is when a fatality happens or, or a serious injury, the police are on the scene. It's obvious in a lot of the news reports, you see the yellow tape. Um, we had a serious uh, fatality in a hotel downtown, I'll speak about in a minute, but the, the thing is that the, it was treated as a crime scene. The place was decayed. the yellow, there was two police cruisers there for like a week and the yellow tape was around the whole building. So we, we started thinking uh, they're taking this seriously. And um, so, and this was the good news, um, but how, if it was in October of 2021, uh, this fatality down at the hotel ended up in court. This was like two years after the fact, this young man um, who's uh, uh, had fallen um, 11, uh, basically 30 meters to his death. Uh, his name was Chris Fifield. He was 26. Um, his, it, it, we found out obviously uh, the company had been taken to court, but there was no criminal charges. It was all to do with violations of uh, the OSH Act. And so, um, and we realized because anytime there's a fatality in Newfoundland and Labrador and we capture it, we make sure we, we get as much information through the news. So we, we realized, and, uh, and Mary and I were talking, and we had five stories in, in front of us over the past year and a half, and all of them were fines. So Mary uh, uh, wrote a press release and they, of the headline, another worker fatality, another fine paid. And we highlighted, as they say, the, this young worker, 26 years of age, who died after falling 30 meters. Um, we had two family men, uh, Jared Moffat and Tim McLean, die while working on transmission line near Come By Chance. And on the province's west coast, a 30-year-old worker by the name of Philip Parsons, I need to name them, died from ele uh, electrocution. And the sad part about Philip's story was his father died a month later and they, uh, the family said it was due to grief. So, um, so that's why Carla's story about dealing with the families was very poignant. Um, the common denominator in all these cases, when they appeared in court, no criminal charges, only fines. In fact, in the case of the young man who died falling from the, ho uh, the hotel, According to the news report, in quotes, the Crown withdrew the remaining charges against the companies and supervisors and recommended penalties in line with similar health and safety cases. And basically, so the charge was because for the death of this young man and his mother who spoke in court about the impact, um, the fine was $60,000 for Lancor concrete and another $15,000 for Magna contractors and the supervisor on site was fined $3,000. So it, the cost of a life seems to be less, is around $70,000 and that seems, this, and the judge actually stated, this is, we have to put it in line with the other cases and all the other cases at the same fines. So in summary, uh, uh, our experience has been, we are seeing more charges. 
We are seeing more of a police presence, but we have yet to see any criminal charges. We don't know if the issue is the police themselves. We don't know if it's the Crown prosecutors or we don't know if it's the judges. Uh, all we know is that we still have a lot of work to do to change this culture of fines uh, when workers die at work. As, as to Chief Boland, he has since retired. So our plan is once again to go visit the RNC and have a con conversation with the new acting chief of police. Solidarity, everyone. Thank you, Bill. Powerful stories that you've told, and we know that they aren't just stories. These are people's realities. These are the experiences that workers are having in their workplace. I had the privilege of being in the room at your 2019 convention when Vernon Terrio told his story, and I happened to be seated at the same table as Chief Boland uh, before his panel. I, I don't think there was a person in the place who wasn't powerfully, powerfully impacted by the telling of, his, of the experience and how it impacted him, his family, and of course, all of the work that happened afterwards. I think all of our speakers this evening have done an incredible job of making this issue very real to us and reminding us that we, we can't simply think about it one day of the year, that there's much left to be done and that our work is, is certainly cut out. At this point, we, we do have several uh, minutes, I would say, you know, five to 10 minutes left. If people have any questions, I would welcome you to post them in chat at this time. Um, I will certainly keep an eye on the chat room. And as your questions come up, I will pose them to the panelists uh, you would like to direct them to. Um, but while we have a couple of moments and we're waiting for some questions to come in, uh, Danny, could I invite you maybe to say a little bit more about what's happening in relation to uh, the May 9th, 30th anniversary celebrations of the West Ray Mine disaster? Sure, sure. And I just want to say we've been we've been well working um, with a group of people, including the steel workers, and who Lawrence mentioned, Sylvia, who I know is participating. Uh, mm -hmm in the call tonight, not as a panelist, but as a, as a guest uh, watching. So we've been, you know, having regular meetings. This is the 30th anniversary of the West Raymond disaster. I think I just want to give a shout out to the steel workers who have been, you know, really the leaders on the whole West Ray file from the time, you know, of the West Raymond disaster forward. They were instrumental in ensuring the West Ray Memorial Park was established. They've they've really been, you know, the leaders around the establishment of that park, making sure it's been looked after over the years. Um, you know, so we really do owe a debt of gratitude to the steel workers, you know, and the others that have, you know, done that work. Just the steel workers have really been, you know, the leaders around uh, much of that and working with the families groups. And those kinds of things. So on May 9th, there will be a service at 7 p.m. in the evening. Uh, Glenn Matheson will be leading that service. There'll be a march, um, as the steel workers have always done a march up to, you know, prior to the service. Um, those services used to be early in the morning. The march was, the mine blew up at 518. The marches used to be at one point in time at 518 in the morning. Uh, they've s since switched that now 30 years later. So the march will be starting uh, at around six o'clock from the curling club up to the Westray Memorial Park. So, so we'll, you know, um, and there'll be an educational component where we're busting some high school kids in where they're here directly from some miners, some draggermen, uh, see some of the tools that were used uh, back you know, 30 years ago in the mining industry, and uh, and that'll be broadcast out into the school system as well. And then there'll be a panel presentation just to talk uh, in general terms with uh, a few people around, you know, a roundtable discussion that will also be live streamed out. So those will we'll start and advertise those in the next few days once we get by uh, tomorrow's a day and morning event at Province House. So the event at Province House is a Federation of Labor event tomorrow. And that'll start just shortly before 11. We want to do 
you know, start off with a moment of silence at 11, hear from our speakers, and then do a, le a wreath uh, laying ceremony as well. Um, this will be the first time in two years because of the pandemic that we've had an in-person event at Province House, and and uh, there'll also be a wreath laying ceremony at the at the memorial service for at the Westray Park on May 9th as well. Anybody has any um, questions around any of that stuff? They can just uh, check our web page, follow us on uh, on social media, and we'll be updating you know things as they kind of get pulled together. Um, also, the partners in the May 9th Westray thing were our uh, you know, the province of Nova Scotia and their Occupational Health and Safety Division and the Workers' Compensation uh, Board as well. And uh, so they're they're all part of that system. So they've actually put in much of the funding to be able to make sure that the 30th anniversary events uh, get pulled off. Great. Thanks, Danny. So some great activities that are happening, uh, both for educational purposes and to raise awareness and certainly uh, to mark tomorrow the National Day of Mourning and then, of course, the 30th anniversary of the West Ray Mine disaster. Uh, I should note that uh, Mary Shortle left us a message in chat wishing people the best. She had to leave to, uh, to get to her speaking engagement that was starting uh, shortly. Uh, but we're really appreciative that Mary was able to join us for a short time tonight. We don't have any questions in chat, but we do have some comments. Uh, people have commented that this has been great information. Uh, a person has said, I just want to thank everyone for participating tonight. It's been very moving and motivating to work on this important issue. And I think that's a great way to sum up our, our, uh, our webinar this evening. It certainly has been a wonderful opportunity for sharing and honoring workers who lost their lives and workers who were either injured or developed serious illness because of their workplace. I'd like to certainly thank all of our speakers this evening, Danny, Carla, Lawrence, and Bill. Uh, your insights have been profound and your stories have been profound. Each one of you has really brought the impact of this work home for all of us, I'm sure. Thank you so much for being with us. And finally, I would like to say a thank you to the people behind the scenes who made this webinar possible. Joan Work at the Nova Scotia Federation of Labor is always a, a, a great one to chip in and help with the marketing and communications of these events and certainly helps to get us and keep us all organized. Brian Lazuri, Jenny McDonald and Sue Hawks from the Cody Institute provide fantastic communication support. I would also like to once again acknowledge the Topshi Memorial Fund that sponsors this event. And finally, I would like to thank all of you for joining us for this important discussion on the eve of the National Day of Mourning. I'm Pauline McIntosh, and I wish you all a very good night.